Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record every one of my lectures and put them on YouTube to share with anyone interested to learn about data analytics, geostatistics, or machine learning. So we had a recent lecture, I'll show it to you right now, where we were talking about declustering as a methodology to correct for spatial bias within sampling data. The lecture, here's the uh, video right here, 9D data analytics reboot, spatial declustering. And if you were in my class or following the lecture in the video, you would see that these were the course notes right here. And it was all about sampling bias, declustering, and debiasing with secondary data. Now, I do apologize. I do have some misalignment between the numbers, letters in my online lecture videos versus my course that I teach within UT. They've evolved a little bit differently from each other. I apologize for that. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to do a demonstration of declustering in Python, all in a Jupyter notebook, which I have open right here. Now, if you want to follow along, and I hope you do, it'd be kind of fun. And we have all of the materials you need, content you need to do this on your own too. So if you go to my GitHub account, Geostats Guy GitHub, I have a set of repositories and I have Python numerical demos. Now, if you scroll through, there's a whole bunch of things here. There's this file right here, Geostats Pi Declustering. That's exactly the workflow I'm working with right now go ahead and download that. Now, if you're new to GitHub, not a big deal, just do a clone or download, and you can select download a zip, grab that file out. Hey, while you're at it, you'll get all of the files. Isn't that great? And you can try out all of the different examples. I have a lot of examples in here. We're also gonna use a data set. I'll show you how to get that too right away. Let's start talking through it though. So, every time I do one of these workflows, I like to put a little documentation up front if you've already watched the lecture you on declustering you know we're talking about the sources of spatial sampling bias and the idea that we could use random sampling to correct for that but we don't we could use regular sampling we sometimes do but in general we're going to have to assume that our data is biased in its sampling and one of the forms of bias is clustering in the good areas higher density of sampling in good locations. How are we going to mitigate it? Well, we're going to go ahead and use declustering to deal with sampling clustering. Okay, not a big deal. So in order to work on this example, you have to work with a spatial data set that I've provided on GitHub. Now, one thing that I've done is I've actually provided on my GitHub repositories if you click on repositories, you can come down here and there's geo data sets. There are a whole bunch of different synthetic but realistic data sets that you can use in order to learn about geostatistics, data analytics, and machine learning. You'll see the data set we need to use here is called sample data biased CSV. So all you have to do is come down here to sample data biased CSV. Just like the code, you can just go up here and do a clone, download the zip, simplest thing to do, grab that file out, put it in your working directory, and away you go. Once you put it in a directory, all you have to do is with this command, set your working directory, and now this workflow will be able to access that data file. There's much more complicated, or I should say more um, technical or robust ways to deal with data. We could use intake to do proper data engineering and so forth. We're just trying to get started. So we'll just load the file up. Okay, so let me walk through the code and explain everything. Now, if you have not set up Anaconda and you have not installed Geostat Pi, you have to complete the getting started part here. I have a video in my series, one of my other videos on just the basics of getting set up that could help you out. Okay, now what we'll do is our first block of code, if you're familiar with Python, this is simply just calling on a package and making some of the functionality available. GeostatPy has two components. One is GeostLib, which is really a set of 
wrappers on the GeoSlib executables and some of the graphics programs re-implemented in Matplotlib with the same GeoSlib type of look and feel. Geostats are actually GeoSlib algorithms rewritten in Python. Now, full credit, of course, to Clayton Deutsch and Andre Janelle for the wonderful GeoSlib, which really this is at best a, trans, a simple translation into Python. I'm, I, I take very little credit. So appreciate all their great work. Now we have to import that. Now, I sometimes forget to run the blocks. I get too excited here. I just ran it. So we imported it the geostat pi package now what we do is we're going to import a couple more packages we don't need very much numpy so we can deal with arrays of data pandas for data frames or tabular data os so we can interact with the operating system of your computer just really just changing the directory that's all we're going to do with that matplotlib pyplot as plt so we can access all the great plotting i use matplotlib a lot very simple very nice for making um, very flexible figures and so forth and then scipy for summary statistics we'll use it just a little bit to do some calculations of summary stats okay we'll change the working directory make sure i you got to run every block of code don't let me forget to do it boy then we're going to set the working directory now, you might wonder what would happen if you get it wrong, would you know? The great thing about working with Jupyter, usually it's no news is good news. Like if I put it like that, and I don't have a folder called PGE383 on my C drive, I'd get an error like that. I just change it to the correct, it's on my D drive, and I run it, I got nothing. Good news, it worked. Now we're gonna load our tabular data up. The data was from the GitHub account, GeoDatasets, I already showed it to you. If you do want, there's just a link right here to it if you want to go straight to it and then download the zip file. Okay, you put in your working directory, make sure it's in that directory and you go ahead and run this command. Now, what happens if you got it in the wrong directory or something went wrong? Well, what if I just put a random number in front there and I ran it? Well, look at that. And this is something I often show my students the first time they look at Jupyter Notebook. You get all of this. And so don't worry. If you get an error like this, it's really easy. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the first line. And that's where your code kind of went somewhere and got in trouble. Something went wrong. And so line number one in that block right there. Okay, so that makes sense. It's this line of code. Something went wrong. But then all of this is what we would call the trace which for people who program this is a list of where it went it went inside this then it went here then it went here then it went here going deeper into the code within the pandas package and so the trace is provided to you because jupyter notebook is assuming you're an expert and you want to get into debugging within and understanding exactly what happened inside the package and so forth and maybe you're not and if you're not just fast forward right here to the very end and you get the actual error file not found error this file does not exist okay so let's just go ahead and change it back we're demonstrating something now if you haven't done too much in pandas this is remember we imported pandas as pd so this is pandas package for data frames read csv is a built-in member function that allows you to load up this data set from that file a csv file and then put it directly into a data frame now it's run and you might wonder well did it work do i know if it actually worked or not could do is use the built-in function to simply do a preview of the first n rows of the data set and so I say, okay, let's use that function. It's the head command. There's also a tail command. Head will give you the first so rows of the data frame and tail will give you the last N number of rows of the data frame. So we go ahead and run that. Not a big deal. And this is what we get, zero through 12, Python indexes at zero. And so 13 would be zero through 12. Not a big deal. And we can see exactly what we loaded up. We have the index. We have the X location, the Y location, a facies indicator. One is sand, zero is something more shaly, worse quality, and we have porosity and permeability. Okay, now I show right here that we could comment that out and use the print command. This right here, we're basically just slicing it up 
and showing the first 0 through 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 index data. It'll go up to 5, but not 5. So we're slicing the rows, and then we're saying show all col columns. So if we go ahead and run that, we'll get something like this, where we see the first 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 rows of the data frame, and we see all of the columns. It's not as nicely formatted, but it looks pretty good. Now, built into data frames, is a function that actually will give you all of the summary statistics or many of the most important summary statistics for all of the features or columns. And so it's the describe command right here. Now, you can also put on top of it a transpose to switch the rows and columns. I find that easier to visualize. So let's go ahead and we run that. It's a nice thing to do every time you load data up to do a little quick QC of the data. Look at the summary statistics. You might wonder what happens if we remove that transpose. Not a big deal. Do you see how we just switched the rows and the columns? I like visualizing it the other way, but it's not a big deal. And so we got the count. Now that count will account for null values. If you have missing values, you'll find some of your columns or features have values less than each other because some of the data is missing. Mean, standard deviation, min, max, and the quartiles. All right, pretty cool stuff. Now, what we're going to do, because we're doing a spatial declustering, we need to specify the area of interest. Now, I know that cell-based declustering is not sensitive to the area of interest. But at the same time, we have to tell it over what area do we want it to make meshes, move meshes around. It's got to know where to be in space. You could imagine if your data was over here with coordinates of millions and you were doing all your calculation here with coordinates of thousands, the, the data would not be found. And so we got to tell it where to work in space. So we're going to say X min, X max, Y min, Y max. We're just setting like a rectangle. We're assuming that the coordinate scheme doesn't need a rotation. If we did, we would have to take care of that separately. And the porosity min, the porosity max. We're doing that because we want color bars to look good. We want to know what's the minimum maximum value we'll use on color bars. And also when we do the scatter plot of declustered mean versus cell sized, we want to know what ranges to use and so forth. We're going to pick a color map from, from matplotlib. Plasma is pretty cool. Inferno is even more epic. So we could go ahead and pick something like Inferno and we go ahead and run. Now, why do I like these color bars, Inferno and Plasma? They're very good for people who have um, color blindness. Rainbow and other types of color bars like that don't have consistent change in tone and intensity and Inferno and Plasma do. And so that means if you can't pick up tone differences, you'll pick up intensity differences and you'll still be able to understand the color bar. And there's also other issues around color bar bias and so forth. I'm not going to get into that. That's for, um, that's a whole different scientific discipline, but we'll use that color bar. In, within the GSLive component of Geostats Pi, it's just a very simple location maps plotting program. We'll run that. Why do we use that? Well, first of all, I'll run it one time. The cool thing about Python, if you type a command with no parameters, and it should have parameters, it'll tell you what the parameters are you should use. It's very simple parameters. What's the data frame, the X column, the Y column, the variable, the min max and the X and Y directions, the variable min max for the color bar, title over the entire plot, the X label, you know, is it X meters or something like that, Y label, the label for the variable and the figure name if you're going to save the figure out. So let's go ahead and we just run this. Now, if we run it, that was pretty awesome. That, that worked really well. We ended up with this nice plot right here, we can see our well data. So that data frame that we're working with, DF, with its X and Y and porosity data, it goes between zero and 1000 meters. If you look up here, that's exactly what we put in. So we're able to know the space that we're working in, zero, 1000 meters up here. And the cool thing about looking at the location map, every time, you work with spatial data, visualize it. Don't just run off and run an algorithm. The cool thing about looking at this is you can immediately look at it and ask yourself the question, do I have clustering? 
Okay, let's think about it. The low values are kind of these darker colors down here. The brighter colors, the lighter colors up top are the higher porosity values. Now look at this map. Where do we have high values? Where do we have low values? And look at the data density at the high and low locations. Very, very dense sampling, very sparse sampling. Clearly, we have a bias in this data set. This is not atypical. This would be a very common subsurface data set. Now you can see if we were to use the average of all that data, what we call the naive average, the equal weighted average of all the data, it would clearly be biased too high. Okay, so we now know we have a spatial bias problem. I think, I think we're pretty confident. Let's go ahead and apply cell-based declustering. The program in GSLab was called Dclus. I re-implemented it in Python, and so it is called Geostats, the Geostats part of the Geostats Pi package, and the program is just called Dclus. Now, it has a whole bunch of parameters. Let's go ahead and run it without the parameters, and it'll tell us. Thank you very much. It tells us exactly what the parameters are we should be working with. <clears throat> and what I've done here is I've listed them and so we can explain them. If you are stuck, go back to the lecture that I pointed to at the beginning, the recorded lecture on declustering and review so that you'll understand what all these parameters are doing. Recall on my YouTube channel, it's this video right here. 9D data analytics reboot, spatial declustering, and you'll get a nice description of all this. Just very quickly though, data frame, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, the value, porosity is what we're gonna be working with. I min max, if set to one, you're going to use the cell size that minimizes the declustered mean. Zero, you're going to look for the cell size that maximizes the declustered mean. We know that we're working with a data set that clearly has sampled at higher density in the high values. We expect it to be biased high. We want to take the cell size that minimizes the declustered mean. Now, in the lecture on declustering, I talked about the fact that there was a sensitivity to this cell mesh location, and we average over multiple cell mesh locations. We average the weights to remove that sensitivity. So this is the number of those cell meshes to average. It's pretty typical to set it as 10 or some large enough number. The number of cells sizes that we want to consider. So typically we'll set that as large enough so we get a good plot or good sampling of the behavior of the declustered mean over multiple cell sizes. So 100 or 1000 or something like that. The program runs pretty quickly for this two dimensional small data set. So not a problem. If you have a larger data set in 3D, and it's running slowly, you could decrease this. C min is the minimum cell size. Remember in the notes, we talked about the idea of the cell size being very small relative to data spacing results in a weight of one for all data. That's a good place to start. Go below the minimum data spacing size and C max is the largest size. What I typically do is set that as probably a couple times the size of the data set. So in this case, around 2000. Okay, so we have all of our parameters. What comes out of the program will be the weights, a one-dimensional array with the same size of the number of data you have, spatial data, in the same order. And it'll be the weight that you assign to each one of the data. Remember declustering, you have originally the data. Now you're also gonna have weights paired with all of the data. And you can calculate all your weighted statistics, weighted CDFs, weighted histograms, weighted kurtosis or skew or anything you wanna weight. It's a more accurate predictive model. Avoid the bias. Now we also have cell sizes and for plotting the decluster mean versus cell size, you need a one dimensional array of all the cell sizes that were considered when your program selected the minimizing or maximizing declustered, um, declustering mean cell sizes. <clears throat> and you also have the D means, which are going to be the declustering means for each one of those cell sizes. So we can do the plot we'll show at the very end. Okay, so if we want to perform declustering, this is a pretty good setup right here. We got the data frame X, Y, the names as strings of the columns and porosity. I min max, while we know we're biased high, we're going to pick the cell size that minimizes the declustered mean. The number of offsets, 10, big enough. It's probably gonna be robust. We remove the sensitivity of the mesh location. D 
the number of cell sizes to consider. I just pick a big number. Just so I'll show you down below so we get a reasonable plot. Cell size minimum of 10 meters. Now, if you go back to the data set, imagine how big 10 meters is. That's to the point where the vast majority of data are going to be in a cell by themselves. The weights are probably going to be one for all of the data. And the max, 2,000, that would be a cell size that would be this big right here, twice the size of our area of interest. That's not a bad idea. We're not going to quite get back to weights of one for all of the data just because of exactly where that cell goes. It's going to cause some weights to deviate from one. If you wanted to make sure they'd get to one, you'd have to pick a cell size that's really, really big. And we don't need to do that. We know where it's going. Okay, so let's go ahead and produce this result. We're going to run declustering right now. When we get the weights, we're gonna add them to the data frame as a brand new column called weights. And then we can visualize the summary, the, the head command to get the first so many rows of the data frame. And how long does it take to run? Not long at all. Now what's really cool about declustering is when it runs, it tells you, well, how many data you had, kind of some summary statistics, the mean of the original mean that you had in the data, the min and the max, standard deviation, a little diagnostics before it runs, and then it produces the weight one-dimensional array and we added it. So for this data value at this X and Y location, that's its weight. So you see what happened? Its weight is 3.0. In other words, that data value is in a location spatially that's very sparsely sampled. It should get much more weight. Then you have data like this, which are 0.997. That's really nominal weight at that point. Those are data values at a location where it's neither clustered or sparsely sampled. It's about what you'd expect if you had equal sampling all over the entire area of interest. Now let's go ahead. A great thing to do is to visualize the weights. And the way I like to do that is plot them and look at the weights spatially. Now this is fascinating. Look at right here. Wow, the data is very dense right there. The weights are like 0.5 or even lower. So we have very low weights in those areas. Then if you look right here on the edges here, data seems to be more sparsely sampled at that location. And the weights are going up to more like 1.5, 2 point something. Now, the thing I want to be clear about here, it may seem like this method is sensitive to the boundary, but it's not. If I took this boundary of 1,000 by 1,000 and I expanded it out here to 1,500 by negative 500 and made a big square like this, those weights would not change. Now, the values that are the data samples, I should say, that are right on the edge of the area of interest do have greater weight because they are perceived to be more sparsely sampled. Now, that's because the clustering doesn't actually see the boundary. It, it just sees this as being less densely sampled because of all this space around it. Now, there is the polygonal-based method that actually is sensitive to the boundary that could be used instead. I have a workflow with that, but for the pur purpose of this undergrad class and all the things we need to cover, I'm not going to spend time on that. I think it's good enough to introduce one methodology. Numerically, I talked about the polygonal declustering in the lecture. Okay, so we looked at the weights. That's really cool. If I wanted to visualize kind of the whole thing and kind of, you know, get everything I need from this result, this is what I would look at. First of all, I would calculate the naive mean. And then we already did that. The program told us it's 13.5% porosity is the naive or equal weighted average of all of the original data. The porosity declustered mean is 12.1% down about 10%. Now imagine oil in place volumetrics are going to be down 10%. This is a significant change through declustering. Okay. We can also look at, we had the map of the declustered weights. We can look at the distribution of the declustered weights. Not a bad idea. Look at the spread. See if you have outliers. If I had a bunch of values over here, I'd probably want to identify them, go back here and try to figure out what happened. See if that's fair. I don't want to have something unusual going on here. Then what we can do is we can look at the original distribution for the porosity values between about 5% and about 23% porosity. Looks a little bit like it could be bimodal, like there's two facies mixed together. And we know there was. We, we have facies 1 and facies 2 within the data set. Then if you look at the declustered porosity, see how it's changed? 
A lot of these values in the highs have gone down with lower weight. A lot of the values here on this side have actually raised up more weight. Okay, and that's the reason we now have a 10% decrease in the average. Now, one more plot I wanna show you and I promise you I'll be finished. Okay, so let's look at the diagnostic plot of declustered mean versus cell size. So we'll go ahead and run that. Uh, what I've done here is just built a nice little kind of cool custom plot with matplotlib. I'm kind of, I like being able to put labels on everything. And so this is really just a scatter plot. I labeled X and Y axis, put a title on it. I'm going to go ahead and plot the naive, um, the naive mean on the plot so we can make a comparison, label everything on it. Let's go ahead and take a look. Okay. Wow. So that, I think that's a great plot because what we can see is remember we said we want to build a hundred cell sizes going between 10 and 2000 and they're isotropic. They're going to be the same in the X and Y direction. So this is the result from the 10 by 10 cell. And I told you they'd be really close to the weight of one for everyone in the data. And it's true. That point is almost at the naive porosity mean. If I went smaller, like a meter, I guarantee you we would get to the naive mean. Then as we increase the cell size, look what happens to the declustered mean on this axis. We go down, we go down, we go down. Remember the minimizing declustered mean was around 12% or so, right? And so you can see that really big drop, that drop of about 10% in porosity. Okay, and now you can see that as we increase the cell size, what happens, it slowly starts to go back up. And we know when you get to a huge massive cell size that all the data will get back to equal weighted again. What we do, our convention, our engineering convention is to pick the cell size that minimizes the declustered mean. And that's a conservative approach. I've mentioned in the course lecture that if you know something about the nominal spacing of the data, you can pick that out and use that, that's probably a better choice. But this is what we'll do given for this data set, there's not really kind of a clear nominal spacing and then some type of um, infill drilling or something like that. So we'll go ahead and use this. All right, and so that cell size of about 200, and we could find out exactly what it is, but about 200 is exactly what was used in order to calculate these weights because we told the program to take the cell size that minimized this the declustered mean. Now you could see if I pick like 10 for the number of cell sizes to consider, I'd only have one, two, three, four. I'd have very few points here and I'd probably miss the very best cell size. That's why we say use enough cell sizes so we can visualize this relationship. And you can see that if you'd set the minimum cell size as being too large, like 500, you would mix, miss this part of the behavior and your choice for the cell size would not be correct. All right. I hope this was helpful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record all my lectures. I put all my demonstrations and workflows on GitHub, as you can see from this example right here. And I hope this was helpful to you to learn an important and underused algorithm and concept to be able to correct and mitigate for spatial clustering. All of our spatial data sets are biased until assume they're biased unless proven otherwise. Most of the time they're biased. All right. I hope this was helpful, guys. All right. Take care.